that's my very long ramble. Sorry, that you, no, it's fine. You got some really good questions because, like, you get me going, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm off to the races. Hello, everyone. Today I have the incredible honor of talking to none other than Nathan, known for his groundbreaking work in game development. Nathan's journey and insights have captivated fans and inspiring developers alike. I am beyond excited to dive into your creative process learn more about your inspirations and hear your advice for those of us dreaming to make our mark in the field. So let's jump right into it. Thank you very much for accepting this, Nathan. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to have you all watching. Thank you for like <laughs> listening to me ramble about game dev. It's my favorite pastime, I think, just talking about making games. But yeah, so really excited to, to get into it. So what originally sparked your passion for game development and what inspired you to make it your career? Uh, it's funny. Um, growing up, I always wanted to make movies. I watched a lot of Star Wars and like on those DVD sets, they had like a whole bunch of behind the scenes and I'd see George Lucas like making all the films. And growing up as like childhood, I was like, I want to make movies. I'm going to make Star Wars episodes seven eight and nine that's what i'm going to do and that was my goal for like a very long time during like my earlier years and then i think it was around the age of 14 um in the early like 2010s is when minecraft came out and i started um doing like private servers with my friends and i remember i think it was one of the first few years of minecraft they brought out the uh, documentary with notch and i remember watching it on youtube it was like a, a preview version you can still watch it online um, and there was this portion where Notch was just debugging Minecraft and showing them how you can, you know, make an exploding arrow and just, you know, he would have the game up and then go to, you know, Eclipse, which was the editor he was using, and he just changed things. And to me, I was like, that's, that's amazing. You can do that. Like, I knew how to make movies. I was making, you know, stuff with my video camera all through my childhood. Like, loved video games, and I always played, like, my Xbox and PC and love, you know, Nintendo stuff, but I never understood how to make games it was a black box to me um but when i saw this documentary and saw that oh you just need a computer and a keyboard and basically just be a really smart person you can make games to me that started my journey of you know learning how to program a lot of it at the start was just doing minecraft servers so like doing plugins used a bucket server a lot and like obviously at that time you know my friends and I, after school, would get home, would up on the server, and I'd be, you know, modding new stuff into the game, and we'd start, like, economies and all this sort of stuff. And it was always, like, um, it, it was funny. We had an old Mac computer, and that's what ran my friends and I server. Like, it was just, like, this bucket server that ran on this, like, iMac. Um, and whenever it, like, closed down or there's a power outage, my friends would message me and be like, yo, Nathan, the server's down. Turn it back, put it back on. Um, and so that was kind of like my early stages on being um, exposed to like programming. Obviously at school, did some courses and like HTML and very like basic stuff. Even used learning Visual Basic, the programming language, which they don't use anymore for good reason. I wanted to be what Notch was. Basically from there is where I learned, um, you know, I downloaded Unity. Uh, back in the day, they had the Unreal SDK, which I played around with a bit. And then just anything I could get my hands on, like I learned Blender. And that was kind of the start of, it was usually around, I think it was like Unity 3. So things were still kind of getting the start of like solo game dev, indie game dev. Games like um, Super Meat Boy and um, Braid and games like that had come out. And so like the 360 and stuff, indie arcade and everything was kind of beginning to boom. Um, and I was just this like young kid with so much potential in the light in my eyes I was like oh everyone's making games now you need to work at this big company and you know it was really exciting time and so from there basically I just got more and more involved and learned more and more and then through the years yeah it's just been that gradual progression of you know learning different stuff and so yeah that's kind of how I got started and basically from there on it's just keep learning and keep making things yeah that's great i empathize with this a lot because i feel like minecraft has also been a huge starting point for me as well i always ask myself how are they making this stuff you know but never really got into it yeah i have a bit of a regret when it comes to that because i could have started it even earlier but still it's never too late so here i am <laughs> yeah exactly but well, even now like i've gone on discords and there's like kids who are like eight years old and they're programming games in Unity better than I can now. Like they understand oh. the fundamentals of like C sharp and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so far behind these eight year olds. But you know, because they're younger and they've got more time and more, you know, energy and stuff, they can just understand it. Where for me, it's like, oh, back in the day, all I had was brackies, but it was like three videos, you know. I also agree with that. Like it's never, 
ever too late to start making games. Even if you're like 40, 50, retired, or whatever, we shouldn't gatekeep the age, I think, because then it's like gatekeeping painting or like writing or whatever else. It's like, they're all skills that you can learn over time. And obviously I feel like game dev can feel like a young man's game because of some of the cultural things in terms of like, how much you work and you know the things you put in and the trends and stuff but yeah i totally agree i don't think anyone should ever feel like they're too old to start making games so when you have a concept for a game how do you go about shaping it from an idea into an actual playable experience do you have a specific starting point for me it depends on the idea i had for many years like a, a call that my my game journal of all the ideas i i wrote down um and i don't think i've actually made any a lot of it like i've taken concepts from things and that was during a time in my life where I couldn't make games as much, whether I was studying or doing other things where it's like, okay, this is a big project, I write down all my ideas and work on it. But for example, with my most recent game I'm working on right now, Coco Loco, it started with obviously like the idea phase of, okay, I wanna make something after playing Animal Crossing, I was like, I love the roost and that little cafe area, but I wish it had more to it than just sitting and drinking, which was like a mini game. And I was like, okay, I think I can make that. And so it was basically first, opening unity and prototyping getting a character control in i think that's for me now the best way that i can start momentum is starting with a very basic prototype because from there sometimes you know if i do a giant design document there might be a concept or a mechanic that doesn't work well i think it's better to start with a very basic project and with your own skill set try to make something from that um, and sometimes that's you know the original idea that you had um, but there's also ways that you need to like pivot and change things or even like scope up or down. You know, if you have an idea for a game and you make it in two days, well then, hey, you can maybe scale that up a bit into something that's a bit bigger. So for me, it's mostly trying to get my hands dirty as quickly as I can um, because then usually reality hits me in the face saying, Nathan, you're scoping up too big, okay? You've been doing this for six weeks now and you haven't got a, a playable prototype. I don't know, for me, it helps to be more realistic with what the project's gonna end up being in, you know, where for me, if I'm in a design document or if I'm just um, brainstorming a lot, things can scale up very quickly. And sometimes I lose sight of the original idea. Sometimes it's even just putting in a few prepaid like assets that I have and seeing if they work well together and then kind of going from there. What do you think is key to keeping players fully engaged? It's a really good question. There's two areas of it, I think. I think one is respecting players' time. I think we've seen a lot of games more recently that really all the mechanics they include, especially with mobile games. Like recently I started playing the new um, Pokemon TGC Pocket and that has taken up so much of my time just because of how addictive it is. Like all the mechanics keep me engaged. But it sucks because when I'm so engaged for so long, I eventually burnt out good engagement is actually having like an ebb and flow um, very much like other things in life I feel like for example with when I do live streams on my own channel I like to have high energy for like maybe the first half hour to an hour and then have a low energy and you know having that kind of wavelength of you know high engagement low, low engagement for players as well I think helps them not get too fatigued you know things like cutscenes and stuff are actually quite helpful to give players a rest and also a reward for what they've done obviously there's heaps of mechanics of you know changing things up I think good examples are like Cult of the Lamb, where you're doing half of it is is dungeon crawling, and the half is just cultivating, you know, a farm area basically or a cult, and kind of switching between those two things. But I also think the most important thing really is respecting players' time. But for example, I've got friends who play a lot of MOBAs. As soon as they feel like they've been disrespected, they will stop playing that game completely. And so I think, in the long term, if you want to have really good play time with your players, it's to have that high and low energy or engagement. Um, which keeps them coming back. Uh, and I think for solo devs as well, and people who are making smaller games, always trying to give more bite-sized bite content and making people want to come back for more and having kind of um, that demand will drive more players to play your games rather than if you just made a much wider range of kind of slodge or low effort content that people might be more disinterested in. Like one thing I would love to experiment with in the future is kind of making a lot shorter, high production quality games, if I ever had the, the ability to do so, basically like an Uncharted, but it's like a 40 to two hour playtime. Um, and I feel like there's actually a quite large audience for that because people want high quality content um, with really good engagement, exciting, you know, things. But like, for example, when I played The Last of Us Part Two, by the quarter part of that game, I was so like tired and done for, I couldn't get through with it. So, 
yeah, I, I think just gauging players' levels of interest and the energy they have and trying to make your mechanics around that. Whether it's, you know, okay, the player's bored, we need higher engagement for this area, or they've been desensitized to things, so let's reel things back and start slow again. I totally agree. We also got a question from Blaster, and he asks, do you like 2D games? I do like 2D games. Um, I love my Switch, and so I'll usually be on like the eShop, and I'll just pick up some games that are 2D. And, and 2D, especially when it's done by like really good artists, can be quite beautiful games. So I, I love all types of games. People will say what my favorite game is. It's like, I can't pick, there's too many. Do you focus more on current trends or prioritize your personal creative vision? How do you find the right balance? Me personally, right now, it is definitely more creative vision and then trying to wrap around kind of trends and marketing around that. With my current game I'm working on, I want that to be something original and I can look back at and be proud of. I think it also depends on what you want to accomplish as a game developer. If you want to be uh, someone who's in the business of it, who wants to build a brand and a studio and a business, then you need to be more focused on the trends and on the things that people actually want to play, because uh, that's just the smart thing to do. You know, If you want to make money making games, then you need to follow what the market's doing. Um, but if you're someone who wants to be more artistic, who maybe is less concerned about the money, maybe you've got other, other things, other ways of making income, and games are a way for you to express yourself, then yeah, focus on your vision because there, there's still room for that. Um, I went to, a few weeks ago, we had uh, Melbourne International Games Week, which was a bunch of game events throughout the week. And obviously that was the business side of it. We had um, bigger companies releasing games and doing talks and stuff. But there was this one event called Parallels where basically they have, it's more focused on the cultural impact of games. They'll have like games from students and um, independent creators who are just making things that kind of ha have a message more than a business practice. And people will love it because it's, it's expressive, it's different, it's unique. Um, and the talks and stuff that too, just expressing, you know, it wasn't about the business, it was about here's my vision for this game. Here's the thing I want to experiment with. Because that's the thing in society, we need obviously um, an economy. And part of that is the business side and making things people can consume. But there's also the artistic side and things that people can, you know, be more philosophical about. There's a mesh of two and depending on what you want to do, um, you have to decide for, for yourself. That's one thing I learned, especially the past uh, week or so talking to people, is that like you take the advice that you you're given but then you also need to kind of use your own judgment on things because the people giving you advice did the same thing for what they did they got advice from someone else and then they did their own thing and so when you're looking at what you want to make you need to first ask yourself what is what are my goals making this game um, and then from there you can kind of direct yourself more towards the artistic sense um, or the business side of it. That's very wise. Have you ever released a game on Nintendo Switch? Not yet, but I plan to. The game I'm working on right now, I kind of initially had the idea of porting it to the Switch. Platform is a bit different. Like I want to personally port it myself, and so that's a lot more work. A publisher would technically be easier because they kind of have systems set up for it. So it is something when I'm developing my game now, I, I keep in mind whether it's through uh, mechanics and controller input, but also even like the back end stuff, consoles and stuff will have restrictions on how you can actually program your game. You know, um, I know with Unity and player prefabs, how they, you know, people will save data. You can't actually use that on consoles. That's not a, a safe method of saving data. And even things like um, having a start screen you need to have on consoles so they can register what controller you're using and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm still in the kind of early production period of my game, but I'm always thinking about, okay, in the future, if I'm given the opportunity, am I ready for it? Um, and, and always planning ahead, which sometimes is very hard to do because you don't know everything, but uh, you know, as long as you network right and you've got a few connections, you can always ask them, you know, because of NDAs and stuff too, they can't tell you the reasons why certain things. But I've had people be like, don't do that because you'll know later. And so you kind of, you listen to them through their like secondhand advice. Could you tell us about a particularly tough moment in your career and how did you overcome it? Was there a moment that truly tested your commitment? Yes. Obviously, there's been many times where I've kind of questioned whether or not I'm valuable enough or skilled enough to make games. And especially when you're around certain people, whether it's friends or families or colleagues who just don't get it. Um, 
it's it's crazy when I went to the the game conventions. The why, reason why I love going there is because of how included I felt. Everyone knew what making games was and and what it took to make them, and were all passionate about it. But as soon as you go to other groups of people and kind of explain what you want to do, they'll look with you, you know, with a thousand yard stare, being like, "You, you want to do what?" And for from some people, that can be really hurtful because you're like, "Oh, you know, I look for you for my support and advice and wisdom, and you're saying this thing I love." Um, I shouldn't do. Obviously, growing up, you know, I was always told, "Oh, I have have a plan B," which I kind of do. Um, but it's it's always been something that I've been very resilient in, and making sure that what I want to do is make games. And no matter what anyone says, I'm going to be making games for the rest of my life. There's always been times in my life where things have, you know, because because games are such a large commitment. There's been times where things have been out of balance, whether it's been with my work or with my friends or, you know, doing you know exercise and that sort of stuff. And so there's definitely been quite a few times where I've been burnt out. Um, I know before I, I switched my, my current game project from Unity to Unreal, there was a period where I was like, do I just drop this and give up? You have moments where things, especially when I'm working on games, where I'll get very emotionally invested and things won't work, whether it's a, you know, a problem with the engine or my skill it just isn't to the level that I'm picturing in my head that I want you know a certain model to look or a mechanic isn't working right and I'll have like a, an emotional impulse of like this is too hard I'm giving up I'm not you know yet you have those those doubts those thoughts um, but you know I usually like to take a break watch YouTube videos of other people who are also struggling or working on things and it's just letting that moment pass and kind of reconfiguring yourself being like okay this is what I love to do. And for me, it's like the thought of not making games, I would not be happy if I could not make games. Like, I don't care if it's on like a, a 10 year old laptop using Haiku 8 making games or whether it's using massive rigs and making stuff in Unreal. Like, no matter what it is, I want to be making games. And so that's one thing that's kind of kept me going through it is that no matter what, I want to be making video games. For some reason, it's the one thing that I just love doing consistently. You know, you're doing YouTube videos, I'll get burnt out. Having video ideas for stuff, I'll get burnt out. I will get burnt out on projects on games, but usually the way that I alleviate that is by starting a new side project and then dropping that later. But that's just how a lot of developers work. I kind of just go, man, is this really worth it? Because it's not like a regular job or a regular, you know, hobby or whatever. It's something that's quite demanding of your, your time and energy and skill. For example, musicians, they can spend a day or a week or whatever writing an album or a song. For developers, so many of us get caught up making games for years and years. There's people who've made games for decades. I know people who've gone to like um, universities and schools for making games, and after a semester, they're like, "I'm out. This isn't for me." And this is one thing I had a lecturer say to me. They, you know, they asked, "Why do you want to make games?" Everyone's saying, "Oh, to make money, or you know, to make this idea or whatever." And I just said, "I want to make games because I love making games." And he said to me, "Nathan." you're going to make it in the industry because that is the one thing that will keep you going. If you just have love for the work, just passion for making games, whether it is whatever in the umbrella of making games, because that's very broad as well, um, you'll make it in the industry, which for me, it was like, okay, very reassuring. And it's just trying to keep that drive, um, but also being realistic because at the end of the day, we're not saving lives realistically. Um, and it's something that people can live without. We've lived without video games for a very long time. And so sometimes I remind, I remind myself, you know, maybe go spend time with your family. Maybe go talk to that friend. Maybe do something else because it's not all about games. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, staying committed. It, the one thing I, I've always thought about is um, there's no such thing as a balanced life or balanced work, but there is imbalance. And so a lot of the time when something goes wrong, it means there's a very strong imbalance to something. Um, and so for me, it's always just being aware of, okay, is there something that is quite imbalanced in here and trying to, you know, reconfigure that so that things kind of are more smooth sailing, so to say. Thank you very much for opening up. And I think everyone values your personal experience because it's very good to have role role models you know in this field especially and to see that they are all struggling with something as well it's not like you're alone in this because i feel like a lot of people even in the comment section they're like i failed today and i'm just gonna you know abandon everything and move on to something else because it's very hard and demanding as you said so i feel like it's very important to see 
all the sides or all the problems and everything so yeah and you also mentioned uh, switching from unity to unreal what made you do the switch so it happened around the runtime fee controversy that happened mm. last year that was the push for me to at least try unreal i also tried godot and and basically what i did was when the runtime fee thing happened i was like okay long term i don't want to use this engine as a solo developer because if this is what's happening now what's going to happen in a few years time and I also felt that I'd been using Unity for so long, I, I felt kind of trapped in, well, what if I work at a different company and they use a different engine? And I, I don't feel capable enough at learning a new tool. So for me, it was like trying to challenge myself. And so what I did was I went and made a Godot and Unreal project for my Coca Loco game and said, okay, the first thing I made in Unity were these things. Let's try doing that in both engines and see which one I can work in faster. Um, and Unreal ended up being the thing that I just iterated super quickly on. I think it was the blueprints, because at the time I was I was working full time, I was coming home late. You know, by the time you cook, clean, do all the other stuff you need to do, and sit down, my brain is fried. Okay, it doesn't look at a single line of C sharp, but nodes that I can connect dots to, that's something. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I, that's pretty easy to do. And you can just drag it out and then it tells you everything you can connect it with. That that makes my life a lot easier one o'clock in the morning when I'm running off of just caffeinated sodas. Um, and so uh, I I did that. And I also wanted to make myself more available for the, for the industry. It's funny because around the same time that the runtime fee thing happened was when we had our games week in Melbourne. And so um, Unreal had a whole day basically showing you all how to dive into unreal which i'm like okay i went to that and and learned all those things and then i talked to a bunch of people who were weren't hiring at the time but i was kind of asking for career advice and they're like certain companies were like yeah unity is good we're gonna stick with unity like it doesn't really matter so i was like okay cool i'm all covering that end um but some of the other companies and especially for me like as a solo dev i really wanted to make some first person shooters eventually you know in the next 10 years be able to make things in the similar caliber to Half-Life and Dishonored in that same genre of, you know, first person. Obviously, Epic Games uses it for Fortnite. And so every feature they add to Unreal um, has been previewed first in Fortnite, which obviously I don't play Fortnite. That's not really a game for me. I don't hate it because it's something that helps, you know, Epic and the tools that I use. And for me, that was really helpful as well. So for example, like the water system first was built for Fortnite and then they brought it to Unreal broadly. Uh, and they just do the same thing for everything else. And so I felt like I had more hope for the future and I'm, I'm still reluctant. Like Unreal still takes a cut when you make a certain amount of money. And if I become a rich millionaire, I feel like I'm gonna be very reluctant to give them a dime because it's like, no, I made that. Yes, it was your tool, but you know, obviously, you know, when you work for stuff like that, I personally like to have more control of my things. So, so even now, I'm obviously using Unreal to make my, my game and probably will make for future games, but I'm also still experimenting with using Godot um, even now, because I'm going back to school to do a computer science degree, I'm beginning to work on my own game engine in the very limited time I have, you know, learning C++ and figuring out how I can do this myself with the frameworks and stuff they have available online. That's Hopefully. cool. Yeah, yeah, congrats. Also, could you share more about the game that you're currently working on? If not, it's totally fine. So right now, it's so it's called Coco Loco. It's a cozy cafe game. Uh, people don't really know many Flash games, unfortunately, but there were Flash games I played growing up called like Penguin Diner and Diner Dash. And they're basically, you play like a, a waitress and you wait tables. Um, people in the modern day kind of understand more the themes of Overcooked. And so it's like that. But instead of making the orders, you're the ones serving it. Um, and so the original concept, like I said, came from um, Animal Crossing, where you'll be like in this little roost, the cafe, um, and kind of adding a bit more intensity to it. And so I'm, I'm making this independently myself uh, in Unreal. The, the plan is basically to make um, a vertical slice where you can wait tables, upgrade your store, not dynamically, like you can't place tables or furniture and stuff. It's more, here's the space, and then you can upgrade where items are selected to be different styles. I don't know how the story is gonna change or adapt, but for me, I'm, I'm trying to make something that can be like somewhat impactful because I started this kind of out of uh, a lot of like the COVID lockdown restrictions, like here in Australia and in Melbourne, we had super severe restrictions that we couldn't go out or do anything for a very long period of time. And we've actually seen a massive effect on people's ability, like, like kids 
that just haven't had experiences in their youth. They haven't gone to, you know, parties or it's hard because when I say go to parties, I don't mean so much, you know, they didn't have the social interactions they needed to understand and to help them in life. In many ways that people would, you know, graduate and kind of go on a gap year and stuff. There were people who didn't have those experiences. The story of my game as well is I'm trying to find a way in which I can kind of see some of the things that people might need in the world today. And for me, I think one of those things is actually community and focusing on being able to outreach to others. And so in the terms of the story of my game right now, the very rough cut that I have, um, the barista that you're playing as um, basically has lost everything. You know, they've dropped out of school, they've lost their job, you know, the relationships have ended and they've got this barista um, waitress job uh, and your boss is basically trying to help you kind of come into your own. Um, and you have experiences where you have different NPCs uh, whether, you know, it's a single mother who's struggling with her kids or, you know, this young guy who doesn't know how to ask this girl out and kind of having these small experiences through kind of packaged um, with this other gameplay. More of the story is that you should reach out to people more and by you going out and serving others, you're going to be better for it. And so that's kind of, uh, there's other things in the game that, you know, I want people to have their, their heartstrings pulled, but it's a lot, it's to say a lot, but I don't have anything to prove of that yet. So I don't want to promise you that you're going to cry at the end of the game because I don't know yet. I haven't written the game. I'm not sure. Um, but the vision I have is something that hopefully, um, although the game will be quite short, is impactful for people who do play it. And it's accessible enough that, you know, people who may not be, like for me, I'm making it for my wife. I want her to be able to play it and experience it and, you know, feel something after finishing it. If this is the only game I make, I want to be proud of it. And so that's kind of what I'm working towards. Right now, it's very much getting mechanics and visually the art, like I'm doing another art pass, the UI and trying to get my pipeline down so I can do things a bit quicker um, because it, it is very much like 3D uh, Animal Crossing style. Um, and the thing is that takes a long time to do. And so I'm trying to make that a bit faster and maybe cut a few corners that I, where I can. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And obviously side projects in the future, like recently I, I did a, a Slender Man thing on my YouTube channel. I don't know why I did it, honestly, when people were like, this came out of nowhere. Why'd you do it? I'm like, I don't know. I just finished <laughs> the Games Week convention and was like, Halloween's in two weeks. I should do a thing for that. And so I made the Slender Man game. And so I, I, I like to also, I try to restrict myself from doing side projects too much because that has been an issue in the past. And luckily my wife keeps me accountable when I work on different things. She's like, that's not Coco Loco. You need to be more, you know, work on the thing you're meant to. And so the one way I get out of doing that is by doing game jams. I've done some collabs with Dan Poz as well with some Sinti game jams. And then obviously in January, we've got the global game jam, which I'm going to go do. So working on the main project in most of the months and then occasionally when there's an opportunity for doing smaller games um i like to do that because it's fun it's fun to, it, it, it also helps me because in that small span of time where i actually finish something i'm more productive the week after working on coca loco because i'm like all right i'm in the rhythm i can do this making a game jam or doing a game jam i feel like especially if you finish the game and it's and it's decent you feel quite proud of yourself and then therefore going into whatever you work on next, you're usually feeling quite powerful and, and, and confident. Other times though, uh, like I've done a few Cinti ones and I'm just like, man, that was not good. I am burnt out and usually take a, a bit of time off. Yeah, that's I've been doing that for three years now, um, but two of those years were in Unity and I've done more in the one year in Unreal than I have with the two years in Unity, which I'm I always saying people go, oh, that's really impressive. And I'm like, yeah, because Unreal has half the tools I was building in Unity. So, uh, yeah. Didn't expect yeah, that. Um, okay, maybe I will start thinking about Unreal as well more. <laughs> Honestly, depends on like what you need and what you're working with. Um, I've got a friend who he does PS1 horror games. Unity is perfect for that. You know, he can quickly program very basic things. He's already got all the shader stuff set. But for me, for example, my biggest issue in Unity was making a NPC state machine. And having like NPCs go from like spawn to queue to table to drink to order to like there was so many steps and I had to program every single one of them. And because I was doing that late at night, there was just so many issues where Unreal, you just have uh, like an AI system and a, a behavior tree and that was all done for me. And the same thing is like in Godot, this stuff that's just like perfectly 
for it. So it just depends so much on... That's why I say to everyone, it's like, what do you want to make? When you figure that out, then pick the tool. Don't do not do the other way around. Yeah, it won't be what you want it to be. Thank you very much. We will keep that in mind. Also, your game sounds great. And I love the fact that you are thinking about literally everyone, like your wife, the kids that didn't really, you know, had this social interaction experience. And when you mentioned the waitress and the gameplay itself it reminded me of a game that i used to play when i was a child i think it's called penguin diner or dinner something like that that is the exact game that inspired it hardly <laughs> anyone knows it i always say diner dash because everyone's like oh i know that one but penguin diner that is the game so okay. the best way to explain my game is, is animal crossing new horizons meshed with oh. penguin diner one for one. If you merge those together, that is what I want Coco Loco to be. I am so oh. glad that you know what that game is. I know. I, I've spent yeah. so much time playing that game growing up. And same. I love it. Same. Same. I was just coming, I don't even remember, primary school, kindergarten, whatever, coming from school back home and played it for hours and didn't even, you know, my parents were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm playing something and time flies, literally. Yeah, yeah but I love the game. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm very glad. It's similar. I want to see an upgraded version of that. I would love yeah, to play. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm like the 3D version of that. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. That's great. How do you keep your ideas fresh and maintain your motivation over the long hours and big projects? I know you mentioned game jams and small projects, if that's what helps you. But besides that, is there anything else or? Um, yeah, for me, for example, one interesting thing I did was, oh, I think, was it earlier this year? It might have been, or maybe it was last year. Um, they had a, this meetup in Melbourne where I live. Um, and they, it was this guy from overseas who was basically, he, he gave talks on how to pitch your game to publishers. Um, and I also applied to do like a one-on-one -on -one session with him for like 15 minutes. And he had some really good inputs uh, into f different things that publishers look for. And one of the things that he said that I had never thought of before was Twitch integration. And I was like, huh. He's like, yeah, what, what publishers want is they want ways streamers can play the game and viewers can interact with the game and then go back and have rewards. And so I think another way to stay fresh is to be going to different things and looking at different inputs from, from people. Um, obviously, business side people will have different ideas compared to those who are, you know, in a Discord channel. Going to more things and talking with more people. Um, the amount of ideas I've had is just from other people saying things. Uh, I think that's another thing that as developers, we can be quite reclusive and isolated. And so if you ever get a chance, whether it's through like online meetups or things in person locally, even if it means traveling into state or out of country, if you can, doing that, I think allows for uh, different perspectives. And that's helped me a lot. Like I, I haven't thought about the Twitch thing for a while because I've been focusing on other things, but I would never have thought about it or even comprehended it. And I had this whole um, idea of when streamers play the game, and viewers are watching the streamers play the game, if they connect the accounts correctly, because um, basically what you do with Twitch integration is you sign in on the game through Twitch. And depending, for example, if you're streaming, you'll get like certain rewards and those who are watching can get drops. And so I thought, okay, maybe if viewers help streamers complete certain sections of the game, then the viewers get uh, a specific reward and streamers can get, you know, rewards as well. So it's stuff like that where it's like, I never thought about that. And one of the issues I had was like, I feel like people who will play my game and stream it online are just going to play this, you know, thing for two hours and then that be it. But if I put in things like drops and achievements for, you know, you either streaming the game or you watching streamers um, stream it, that adds another element to things that uh, like is, is interesting that I wouldn't have thought of. There's some very creative people um, who you say a concept for a thing and they'll take it completely different, but they'll spin something in a way that you're like, oh, I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it in my game. We'll put it on the list of things that I might do in the future because that's a very clever thing. Getting new ideas is, you know, listening to podcasts and streams like this. There's heaps of them on YouTube now. Just listening to what people have to say. There's so many games out there. 
it's really hard sometimes, especially for me. I feel like I always kind of copy other people's ideas and games and concepts because I'm like, it's proven, it works, I like it, but it's always kind of putting in your own personality and spin. And sometimes it's even just being like, you know what? I would love this mechanic if they just did this instead. And if you work so well with your game, try and incorporate that into it. Maybe there's more fresh new ideas. Yeah, that's true. Now, looking back, what has been one of the most rewarding moments of your career so far? There's been a few. Obviously, whenever I do YouTube videos, like recently I did the Slenderman video, and the reception to that has actually been pretty positive. There's been a few who are like, you should have spent longer on it, and I'm like, you're right, but also I was trying to just, this was meant to be a short project and you're cutting it past two weeks. So this thing needs to get out the door, but I, I'm quite proud of that. And the fact that people have played it and people are like, I kind of want more of this. It's like, oh, okay, that's really cool. More recently, I had incredible experiences at this this week event in, in Melbourne. For me, like the highlight of my experience in games was during that week. Later in that week, they had packs and Steam and stuff where they're, they're announcing that the Steam Deck's coming to Australia officially, which I'm waiting for pre-orders to open up so I can grab my OLED straight away because I'm a Valve fanboy. But at the the business events, um, there was actually one of the developers there. It is my hero. And it was crazy because they, during the event, they have this app called Meet to Match and it shows you all the people at the event and you can reach out to them saying, hey, can you meet at this time to have a chat or sometimes publishers do it to, you know, pitch a game and, and stuff like that. But I, I saw him on there and it was on like, it goes for three days and I think it was on the second day at the end that I saw his name pop up and I was like, oh my goodness. I need to say hi to him at least. And I, I reached out and I was petrified because I'm like, tomorrow's the last day. He's only here for a day. He's probably booked out. But he confirmed it. And I was able to go and talk with him. And I, I fanned out because he, he was the lead on Half-Life Alex, which I absolutely adore. And I was able to talk to him and he was such a chill guy. He's Australian, but obviously moved over there a long time ago. He originally worked on the first um, Team Fortress mod. And then Valve brought them over and he's been working there basically ever since on the Half-Life, TF2, like every Dota, all the stuff there. Um, and so talking with him was, I think, a career highlight because I, I have always wanted to work at Valve. If I accomplish this in life, I will die happy, basically. And having the opportunity randomly on a Wednesday afternoon to talk to one of the developers and say, hey, I love your work. I really appreciate what you're doing. And having like a 15 minute conversation of like, I want to work at Valve one day. What do I need to do? And him laying out everything and having that immediate feedback of this is what I'm doing. This is where I want to go. And him being like, you have potential to work at Valve one day. Like it's not as far out of reach as you think. Like just do these things and, and you can accomplish this. For me, I, I nearly cried that night being like, oh my gosh, like my industry hero came up to me and said, Nathan, you are, you know, you are worth it. You can do it. It's possible. For me, that was a, a career highlight. Like, especially for me, I feel like growing up, I was very isolated in games. I grew up in a more, not rural town, but it was, it was definitely country. And even in Melbourne, it's like our game scene is, is not as big as it is in the US or in Europe. It's very hard to kind of hop countries to get, get over there. You need to either move over there and basically apply, apply for like the lowest entry jobs and work your way up. And I'm honestly not in that position to do that. Or you have to make an impact in the industry here and end up getting recruited over there. And being told that I'm on the correct path and that you can do this and that if you need any help, reach out to me to me was such like a burden lifted of like, okay, this can be a reality for me one day. That for me most recently is one thing that whenever someone says, what's been your highlight recently? For me, it's, it's been that. My second highlight has actually been meeting the friends um, at, these, at these conventions and at these events um, because I feel like a lot of my other friends, although I love them, they don't have the same drive and passion for games that I do. I always felt like I was very outcast in the sense of, you know, they would all go play video games and I'd be just sitting there working on my Unity project being like, does anyone want to help, please? This is too hard. I can't do this. And meeting people who were the same as me, for me, has also been a career highlight in knowing that, you know, when you actually connect with someone like that, it's incredible. Do this and I'll see where you are in a year. That as well is such a career highlight for me. When you're alone working on stuff, and especially when you see, like I think the internet is just terrible for mental health most of the time because of the algorithms. Like you work on your thing and then you'll go on Twitter and it's like, 
I made an engine C++ in 60 days. And I'm like, man, I can't even get my C++ thing to compile. How did you do that in 60 days? And so when you actually go out and speak to real people, it is just such a confidence boost. And the support in the industry is so strong now, especially I think with the layoffs and just how hard the industry is on people. When younger people come up with, you know, bright eyes and optimism, um, the veterans tend to like flock around you and say, there, there, it'll be all right. And they take some of the like fiery arrows and I got, you know, try to make you more aloof to things. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing this experience. I'm also very glad you had the chance to meet up with your hero. I know how much it means considering all these interviews, like the moment people are answering, I'm like, oh my God, this is gonna happen. There's no way. And yeah, I totally agree. And it's amazing. Every time I've met my hero, I've realized how human they are <laughs> and how they're just really good people. That's the thing that shocked me the most, talking to these Valve devs. Oh, I'm not shocked, but like taken back by, they would, every time I talked to them, they were just like, we're trying to make a good experience for players. We, we work hard, we try to have a good balance of things, and they were just really reasonable, hardworking people. Yeah, that's true. I would also love to work for one big company one day. Why not, Valve? I mean, it's pretty big, but we never know. If it's gonna happen exactly we also got a question from blaster and he asks sorry what do you say about asset flip games yeah depends on context that's how i start every question now depends on the context um if you're doing a game jam game it's fine maybe you're just a programmer basically every game is an asset flip even the games that you think have been handcrafted by um artists most of the time half the things they're using they've used in previous games there was a really good video i have no idea where to find it though um, where this guy had a professional sculptor, like a indie dev who was learning sculpting, and then him, the YouTuber, who was also sculpting in Blender. And it's funny because it was kind of a challenge of sculpting from scratch, but the senior guy was like, oh man, I can't use my brushes for this, or oh, I have a base model for this. And like asset flips, I think, as a final definition, are basically just the same assets used in, you know, games to turn a profit. I think that's the best way to define asset flips. I just, you know, you bought something off an asset store, you put it in your game just to to make a buck. At the end of the day, it's not going to hurt many people because if it's not a good game, no one's going to play it. If it is a good game or if it's you know, just a cash grab, like it's it's not going to add much value to the market. Sometimes using Cinti assets is good for a game project because maybe you aren't an artist. There are people out there who don't want to play programmer art games. Maybe the people don't want to make those games either, but they can't find a good enough artist. And so using assets for games are quite important. Like for me, I will occasionally take a texture from online and put it in my game because it's a nice stylized PBR texture and it's it's good, it's how I want it to look. And what's the point of me recreating that if it's already been made? It's the same with using code. Um, most of the time we're just going on forums, getting that line of code that works and putting it in. You're not gonna attack a programmer for reinventing the wheel each time, you know, instead of just copying and pasting something. Um, and so why should we do it for artists? I think it's, oh, like, I know there's always controversy when the new God of War game came out, Ragnarok, people are upset that they used the same animations to get in the boat as it was in the previous game. Yeah, you're getting into a boat. Like, what, you want them to entirely recreate an animation for that? Or do you want more content you can save money on? Um, and so asset flips, again, like if you're talking about just cash grab games, they're going to exist no matter what, and they're not going to add much value to the market anyway, so there's no point in them really, you know, they're not going to hurt anyone or affect anyone. Obviously, there's certain stores and stuff, like we've seen with um, Epic's Fab, a lot of stuff has come out now because they've incorporated Sketch and all this other stuff. So that's been a bit of an issue, and obviously the eShop has a lot of asset flip games. You know, luckily we have filters, like the new and trending, um, and even on Steam, it's like, if you have a good enough algorithm, good games are going to rise to the top. And developers should be able to use assets. Maybe it's just using it as groundwork, maybe it's just using it as you know, temporary files before they replace replace the art with something else. At the end of the day, the public will decide what is the best fate for, for that game, whether it is positive or negative. Yeah, that's true. So the gaming industry is constantly changing with new technology. We know that. How do you envision the future of game dev? How I envision it is probably going to be different to how I want to envision it. I would personally love to see more focus on solo devs. I think one thing I really want to push with 
Unreal is making the tools better for smaller teams to iterate with. There is so much time wasted on certain elements where it's like, I just want to press a button and move on to the next step. I, I don't think I want AI game engines because in the end, you just want to make a game engine, like a regular traditional game engine anyways, because it solves all the problems that you know, we're seeing with like the Minecraft AI game. But I think personally, I want to see ways of speeding up production that is still allowing for creative input. Like for example, I am not a fan of UV unwrapping and I would love for there to be a tool that just UV unwraps it in an instant and it just, it's good, it's its perfect, the textual density is, is fine, but for some reason, no matter what add-on I get, there's still an issue somewhere along the way. My optimistic view of it would be having tools that uh, allow less inputs, but still find control. So being able to just click a button to UV unwrap, but if you're seeing issues with your thing and you want to fix it, so for example, if you're in like a, a senior position at a big game studio, being able to still go into the nitty gritty and adjusting things with how you need. And sometimes you need it for just particular game projects. You know, if you're making a PS1 style game compared to you know, a realistic mega scans game. Those are two very different pipelines. And so finding ways to streamline pipelines, I think is what I want to see the most. I'm expecting personally a very big renaissance in solo devs. And that's why I'm saying that I want these things. And it's very much like Hollywood in the sense of the producers or the ones with the money are making all the decisions. Back in the day, and this is what I've heard at least from veterans, like in the in the 90s and the 2000s, the, the money people would come in maybe once or twice a year and games were kind of, you know, just a throwaway thing. And so, you know, you had these awesome games made by these developers because they could do whatever they want. And the money people were happy because they got their return back. Now we've seen issues with certain big industry um, giants um, trying to squeeze out every dollar. Things like um, Animal Well, which is like how many megabytes of a game has just sold so many copies and has been such a cult classic for people and has been so commercially successful compared to Call of Duty, which is now like 200 gigs on install. Things like that, I feel like it's annoying too, because for me, the reason why I don't download Call of Duty uh, is for a few reasons, but the most grinding reason for me is that I don't want to give up 200 gigs on my hard drive. The people who are making the decisions for that game are not going to know that because I'm not even installing the game. And so uh, I think a lot of the issues that AAA are facing are things that they're not going to see until it's too late, unfortunately. And what we're going to have is an uprise in solo devs. Because what's happened is that like AA has disappeared completely. Um, you either are a very small team and it make really good money because your idea is unique and different, or you are a proven IP, proven mechanics until you're not. And then basically we see you disappear off the face of the earth. Um, and so I think we're going to have a renaissance of solo and indie devs kind of rising up more and either having the new IPs and that ends up becoming the, you know, the seasonal thing that make the new game each year or whatever cycle you want to do. Or you'll see um, a renaissance as well with like one thing I, I saw a lot with um, the game publishers at the Games Week thing was that they're looking for people to pitch, but their budgets were a lot smaller. And so before they were doing like between like one to $20 million budget. Um, but now they're looking at like a couple hundred thousand or like even smaller, you know, pie sized portion to give up money. And with that, you can make games where you can't make massive games. And so I hope to see more double A games come out because I think those are a great balance of um, making a return for the business, but also being allowed to iterate and take risks because the, the risk isn't as big. And therefore, you know, hopefully the money people are more inclined to allow the developers to make the risk. The world's a very weird like place right now with the internet and with trends and with like the amount of people who are in kind of higher up places now who are saying they don't want big games, they want vertical games. It's like, what does that even mean? Well, what it means is they don't want massive open world games. They want smaller games, but might have a range of mechanics you can play through. Like before, earlier I said with Cult of Lamb, you know, having a dungeon crawler, farming sim, horror, like adding more things so that the game is large, not so much in scope, but in being vertical and you can do 
different sorts of things and all those things in scope are small. And so we're seeing a lot of changes in that. Obviously, so many people now are really focused on like the influencer games, which are just games that are very quickly turned around, are really fun to watch, are engaging to play. Yeah, I also think we're kind of reaching a very big saturation point in terms of like Steam is massive and has how many games published a day on it. Xbox um, is just massive now. They have such a massive library. And so people are, I think, going to get burnt out, not so much in playing games, but people are going to realize that there's too much on offer and people are going to stick with what they like. It's very, very interesting. I think games will stick around. I think we've obviously seen issues with like layoffs and with the way the technology is changing. But at the end of the day, it's going to be like back in the 80s with the US. It's like the market will still survive. Like back in the 80s, an Atari fell Japan was thriving and you had some amazing games like Final Fantasy and all the Pokemon and Nintendo stuff like they all lived on and back in the day they didn't have instant like how we do so now when things crash and go down someone else can still give you entertainment and even then like I think about entertainment and I'm like man vi there's video games then like half the time I'm on TikTok and then there's like all the streaming services and there's like there's so much I haven't read a book. Actually, that's a lie. I have read a book this year. But it took me so long to read because of all the other distractions. And so I think the industry is going through this very weird phase of understanding what's actually necessary. And it's sad because obviously people who are going to have jobs and people who are going to invest, there's going to be losses had. And that's what always happens within an economy. And just talking to people like at Valve, who their primary focus is just to make their players happy. It's like, okay, we're in safe hands. If if things go bad for, for one side, there's always going to be other people who will rise up to the call and make good content for us. I just hope that that doesn't mean that there's too much suffering because of people's poor decision making. Uh, that's true. That's my very long ramble. Sorry. that you, No, it's fine. You've got some really good questions because like you get me going and then I'm... <laughs> I'm off to the races. No, I love doing interviews. It's totally fine. Don't worry about that. It's just after every video, I will cut it and make a video out of it. But still, I don't want to remove stuff. So it's probably going to be a long video, but hey, it's good content, right? So I don't mind. Blaster asked you, are you going to release a demo of your game? Yes. So plan is to get a vertical slice. So right now I'm playtesting the game. And once I'm happy with like a very short demo style, it's going to go on Steam. You can wishlist it. Not right now. That's that's not available yet. Um, and then depending on the feedback from the demo, I will either you know do updates. Maybe people will like, I don't like this whole static furniture stuff. I want to design my own restaurant, cafe or whatever. Then I'll go back to the board if there's enough wishlist interest to actually add stuff like that. But if it's mediocre, you know, only a couple of hundred people are like, oh, I like this game, then I'll, I'll work on it. But yeah, there'll be a demo available. Um, and then when it comes out on Steam, it'll come out on Steam and then we'll go from there basically. It's it's very much playing it by year. This is my first big commercial release. So who knows what could happen? I'm very excited. I will definitely play it. I really want to see the upgraded version of Penguins. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Another question from Puzzle Maker. So like, oh, this is back to what I asked you. So like using tools to accelerate game dev to getting the game to the market, AI included? It depends. AI is such a broad word that I like it's used in commercial ways that I, I hate. Like everything now has AI. Like my Windows Copilot, I don't need that. Okay. I just use ChatGPT for when I have issues for things. Certain AI assistant things are perfectly fine. We'll we will see in the future what people accept and what people don't accept. Um, obviously there's been very big back and forth between like what AI art is and whether or not you can use that for certain things. Many artists are very against it and those who are very for it are very vocal about it. And so it's very much a, a sensitive subject, I think. But like AI broadly, basically, we've had AI for years, but it's just been different things. Um, for example, when you automatically UV unwrap, you're just using an algorithm to unwrap your model. And so technically that's kind of AI in a way. They want to make games just completely using AI. We'll see how much that is adopted in the games industry when it comes out. We don't know yet because we don't know the scope of that. And when people say, oh, in the future, it's going to be, you know, this and that, the models that will survive are the ones that you can run on your own machines and give good input, sorry, give good output with very little input needed. Um, because for me, example, I've tried doing AI art stuff and the amount of effort you need to train models and to then iterate on certain things for me to be happy with what I want my art to be 
I may as well just go learn art traditionally because I can just draw it myself. What you need is tools that can produce the work that you want in less time, but also gives you the refined features that you need to manipulate it very quickly or adaptable. So, you know, I, I think tools like Blender and Unity and Unreal, those are all very good tools because they help you do things quickly, but they also give you refinement for them, if that makes sense. So AI, I wouldn't say I'm for or against it. I think it's just, it's a word that I'm jaded in hearing because it usually means a big discussion about something that no one knows much about and making predictions to things where it's like, okay, right now everyone's adding AI assistance to all their services. Eventually that's gonna run out because they're gonna realize that we're spending all this money to license out ChatGPT, but no one's using it because no one needs it in whatever service we're adding it into. Yeah, interesting point of view. And my final question for you is, for those just getting started, what's one piece of advice you wish you had received earlier in your career? I feel like I prepared for this one, but I'm still not ready for it. Figure out what you want to do first. And once you've found something you enjoy, like for example, if you want to get a, a job in games, pick a career, whether it is rigging, programming, and being specific in the programming. Is it like AI programming? Is it porting old games to new platforms? Figure out a career path that you actually want and then hyper focus on the skill set you need to get there. Um, I feel like I right now have a job in games if I just focused on something and didn't get distracted every you know year on working and doing a new thing. When you work with others, it can either accelerate you or it can limit you greatly and make the experience terrible. Growing up, I did quite a few projects that were like massive MMO RPG zombie shooters that never went anywhere because no one did anything. We all just worked in the design document and, you know, I was an experience that had no idea how to even program, let alone, you know, do something as big as that. And so I think, and it's hard for people too, because some of us aren't in the position to collaborate with people. And sometimes you just can't find the network you need. Um, but my two words of advice is if you want to find a job in games, specialize in something and focus on it and be become, become as good as you can in that field and you will get a job in games um, and try not to get too distracted with other things. And if you want to get a job in games, then do jobs that are specialized. People aren't always going to go for So don't just be a programmer, be a programmer in something, whether it is like CPU infrastructure, whether it is like gameplay programming, specialize in something in that area when you're doing art you know get really good at just doing one type of art it's it's good to generalize but i think if you want a job in games you need to specialize as well uh, i know especially for certain roles things like um, technical artists whether that's rigging vfx shaders finding those very particular things and specializing in them will give you such an advantage when you're applying for jobs I don't know, it's such a hard question to answer because I feel like people are going to listen to this and take on whatever I say on board be like, oh yes, Nathan said this, therefore I will listen to it. But I think the one thing I, I wish I knew starting out was that when you do hear advice from people like me or whoever on the internet, take the wisdom, but then put your perspective in it. For example, for me, I basically saw Notch and said, all right, therefore, to be like Notch, I need to go make Minecraft with Java and do all these things. I can't do that, though, because one, I'm not Notch. I'm not in Sweden, and Java, Java, Java has already been made with you know, Minecraft and stuff. Like, it's all been done before. What you need to do is take the more conceptual learnings from those things and, and have your own story and experience. Take people's wisdom and then apply it to your own and, and be yourself in the sense of like, okay, this is what you're making. This is the thing you need to work on. You're not making Minecraft. You're not making this game that you're trying to replicate. You're making your game. Because when I've seen people, you know, those who have made like Animal World, I'm trying to think of like, just look at any indie game, basically. They were inspired by something, but they create something completely new and different and they they had their own story and experiences and your story and experience will be very different to theirs in many ways you'll have different trials you have you know different limitations to them different skill sets and as long as you're taking in wisdom and then basically going out on your own that's the best thing i can give to you because you know I, I could go say go get a job in rigging because that's gonna make you the most money and this and that but at the end of the day, that might not be the case for you because you have a different skill set and mindset to me. And so I wish going out and learning to begin with is that like your journey is going to be very different 
in games. And I guess the last thing that I would wish I knew is that most people stumble into game jobs accidentally. It's not on purpose. And so a lot of the time you'll just be working on a thing and the, the time that you're not expecting to get a job offer or get into games or have that opportunity blow up, it's when you least expect it to happen. Um, you know, I, I've been given soft job offers when I wasn't looking for work compared to when I was going to everyone saying I want a job and there was nothing there for me. And so sometimes you just have to stick through it to the end, keep doing what you're doing. And when you least expect it, that's when the opportunity comes. And when you do have those opportunities, take them. That's, that's my TED talk. Great TED talk indeed. You also made me very curious about the Minecraft documentary because I don't think I've ever watched it. I didn't know about its existence and I'm sad. Yeah, if you just go to on YouTube, uh, One Player Productions, Minecraft, and that's where you will find it. They had a full length documentary, which I think you can buy online somewhere. But for me, it's like that, that preview is the thing that like sparked me. And it was just basically them going to, um, to Notch and like seeing his little studio and him working and him like hiring Jeb and everyone kind of talking about like, oh, what is this Minecraft game? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's awesome. It's the thing that I still go back to, to remind myself of like, this is where I came from. And this is the thing that's gonna, you know, when people ask me, why do you make games? I point to this and say, for some reason, this video, you know, flipped a switch in my head and now I'm like addicted to making video games. That's a nice obsession, I would say. <laughs> also another question from Blaster. How do you market your game? Oh boy, that's a whole other video in of itself. I've actually <laughs> learned a lot recently about that. Go into these events, find someone who is maybe freelance. You'll find people who just love marketing games. This is something that I've discovered. And as soon as you ask them like one question of like, how would you do this? They will just tell you all the industry trends and secrets. Um, like I've got one one friend who I talk to each year, and he tells me all the updates and all the things. And it was funny too. I they had a, an after party kind of thing with this whole Games Week thing in Melbourne, and this one guy was you know talking about how he put his game on Reddit and got wish lists. And I was like, man, how'd you go on Reddit and not get banned? And then it was like a four hour discussion on how to market your game on Reddit, and I was like, wow. Because the funny answer to that question was, how do you not get banned? It's, uh, yeah, get banned, but then go to the next subreddit. Like, Reddit isn't just r slash game dev. Like, go to any subreddit that is related to the topic of your thing. Like, for me, for example, he's like, you're in Melbourne? Put it in r slash Melbourne. You're, a, you know, a, a, a cafe thing? Okay, put it in r slash cafe or coffee or whatever else. Like, finding different subreddits to put your game in. And if you get banned, so what? Appeal, try it again, you know, change things or whatever, but just like going through. The best way I've at least heard more recently in marketing your game, especially if you can get it for influencers, is just reaching out to influencers and getting them to, to play your game. That is probably one of the best ways and the most like cheapest ways, I think, to get your game marketed now is getting people who are making content like this online to show your game. It's a lot cheaper to do that and maybe even pay them for a sponsor segment than it is technically to start your own YouTube channel and do devlogs and all those other things. Because let me tell you, a lot of time and energy and effort and wasted money in the sense of like the investment I put into the channel rather than other things I could have, like a part-time job. Um, technically right now isn't worth it. In the long term, I hope it is. And at the end of the day, it's just a thing I love doing. I love making videos. Um, but marketing your game, you, you have to figure it out. And the best way to do it is just to find someone at an event or maybe even in discords who like marketing and just try to get them to talk and then listen. That's that's other thing too is like, just listen to some of these people because if you let them, they're like me. Like you ask one question and then we don't stop talking and we just give you all the knowledge in our head. And then by the end of the fourth hour, you're like, I'm, I've learned so much, which hopefully you all have watching this. Um, but yeah, marketing your game, it's it's a tricky one because, again, it depends on context. Is it a mobile game? Is it uh, for consoles? Is it for PC? Uh, what type of game is it? You know, there's, there's all these different things you've got to figure out. Like for me, the way I'm going to market my game is obviously through my own YouTube channel, um, but also reaching out to cozy YouTube streamers and, and stuff like that, getting that cozy market. And then also figuring out from there more interesting ways to to market your game um like for me i'd love to go to just like cafes and say hey i'm making a game can i put my little poster in your shop 
um, or even one thing I, oh, I sometimes I get these random ideas of things that I'm like, I want to experiment just to see see what happens if I do this. Because um, I don't know for those watching if you have this, but in my country, in like the malls and shopping centers, you have people who like stand around looking for donations or they're like selling things or like where, where Santa is and you get uh, the Santa pictures. I want to rent out one of those spaces during the year and just have people like a like a game convention basically, but in the middle of like a shopping mall near um, like EB Games or GameStop or you know whatever store that's that's near you, and just see if you get anything from that. Because I think as well like um, you can do things on TikTok and social media, but then it's like man, talking to social media managers now. And some of them are like, you just got to be edgy. And I don't have that in me to be that. Um, and other people were just like, you got to be creative. Um, some of the best marketing campaigns are just ones of people just being really smart and knowing how to do things. And we don't always have that skill set. And so if you're someone who isn't confident in marketing or maybe who feels very out of their depth, the best way to do it is to probably go to someone who is more knowledgeable. Maybe they're freelance. Maybe they do other things um, and just reach out to them, maybe budget in a way to to use their time and experience. For me, marketing your game is basically trying to find the audience that wants to play your game. And for some things, like with YouTube videos, YouTube does that for me. They find the audience for me. But with games, sometimes if it's a good, enu good enough game on Steam, if you do the correct things um, with, you know, titles and banners and descriptions, you could be lucky enough to just get picked up with the Steam algorithm. Thank you very much. Yeah. A great answer though i also learned a lot nathan thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us it's been inspiring to hear about your journey and the passion that drives your work so yeah thank you very much for accepting this interview and being here it really means a lot it's been so fun to talk and mm -hmm. yeah i i'm usually a very quiet person but as soon as someone says hey don't talk video games i will just take the conversation and just so i wish i could talk to you more about things and maybe i'll have you on mine and we can do reverse reverse interview when Ooh. i have time um but yeah i i really appreciate it i hope you've all enjoyed the video and had fun because i definitely have and yeah good luck to everyone making your games you know make make you. good games thank you very much it's been a pleasure and hopefully we will see each other again <laughs> soon enough yes i hope so yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Take care and good luck on your game. Thank you. Bye. See ya.